Isn't the Lord good today, saints of God? And we just want to continue to pray for our afflicted ones. Having compassion and um, having the same attitude Christ has toward the suffering and the sick. Uh, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. And he went about doing good and healing all that were sick and afflicted. Uh, how he anointed with the Holy Ghost with power, went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. God was with him. And then David cried out in Psalms uh, 51. He said uh, there in that beautiful chapter, have mercy, verse 1. Upon me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness, uh, un according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Uh, isn't that beautiful? Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. So the Lord is in that work, and I pray for Sister Wallace, I pray for Sister Nadi. I pray for these ones that are so afflicted and going through such pain. And early in the morning, we were praying this morning with the saints that were calling in, saying, please pray for me. And Sister Sylvia, in terrible pain early this morning, and Chandler, so we, and then we were at the hospital earlier and praying with Sister Betty Owens. So everywhere you go, the people of God need compassion. They need understanding. They need love. They need care. We must be a compassionate church. We must be a caring church. As I gave that lesson last night on the uh, <laughs> principle of the body of Christ. There are several principles of the body of Christ, the church of the living God, uh, that um, we, we just need to understand. We need to know. We need to practice them because we are his disciples, and we that are strong must bear the infirmities of them that are weak because at some point you're going to be weak. If you haven't been weak, you're going to be weak. You won't always live your life and be strong. There'll be a moment when you're weak and you'll go through weakness and you'll feel weakness. If the people of God had not had compassion with me, if they had not been merciful to me, in these 65 years of changes from a child of 12 to an adult, older man of 77, I would not be here. It's been the compassion, it's been the kindness. It hasn't been my strength. I was strong at times. I could help others and did help others and do help others. I haven't always been strong. You're not always strong. There's moments when you're weak and you need uh, to show compassion. And I need to show compassion and care one for another and uh, we're so glad to have everybody here. Sister Sheila Cobb, it's so good to see her in service and to have her yes. with us. Yes. And she's part of the Dravenstadt family. And the Dravenstadt family has been involved with this church for nearly 40 years uh, since her father came here to teach school when he was minister of the Nazarene Church in Palmetto. Yes. And they took his church from him and they took his parsonage and they took his cabin on the campground and uh, they took his license. But he didn't mind that. Brother Dravenstadt, Brother Delmer said, take them, take them. I found more truth. I found a deeper way. I found a, another way to go. I found a higher way. I, and God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And his wife came over and he filled Sister Mildred the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, and uh, they cost them their uh, 
church cost them their license. The, the DS, the district superintendent, yeah. told him, if you don't leave those people, your license goes. You can't be a minister of the Nazarene church. Brother Draven Stapp said, well, take the license. I'm going to be with God's family. He said, well, we'll take your parsonage. I said, I'll move out. We'll find an apartment. And he did. And he said, well, we'll take your cabin on the campground. I said, take that. Uh, and uh, he gave it all up to follow the family of God. And right behind him come Brother Short. Uh, dear Brother Short. And Brother Short said, take mine too. He was a member. He was a district superintendent in Indianapolis of the Nazarene faith. And he said, well, take mine too. Because I found these people and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience in the Lord that God gave those uh, dear children, those people of God. And we want to just um, be thankful and we want to have uh, compassion and, and mercy because God is doing a great work now. And he's still bringing people in to the church. He's still talking to people. People are still getting revelation of the church. They're still being anointed of God. This church has not lost its covering. It hasn't lost its anointing. This church is still a bright, shining light uh, out through the nation of America. And uh, it is a place, it's a house of refuge where the name of the Lord is uh, kept here, honored here. The name of the Lord, strong tower, righteous run into it and are safe. And so the Lord is still overshadowing us, helping us uh, to grow in grace, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, still bringing people, still uh, talking to people. And they're still giving up. They're still giving up uh, what they could have, fortunes and fame in some cases, and houses and land. And they're giving it up to follow this people, to stay uh, with this church. Um, I, I don't know, I can't speak of you, but I wouldn't be in the city of Bradenton if it were not for the church. The reason I'm living here is the church. The reason I continue to live here is the church. The reason I'll not move very far from here is because the church is here. This is where God wants me to be. This is the place where God called me. Uh, I could uh, have many other places that I could go. You could have many other places you could go. I don't know that this would be your choice, uh, but it wouldn't be mine. Uh, I have many other places I would probably wander to, but I stay because this is the place where God called me. This is the name of the Lord. It's where I receive revelation, where there's still a covering, where there's still an anointing of God. And see, um, you're not your own. You just can't pick up and go somewhere, move somewhere, do something. That is, you can't if you have a revelation, if God has called you, if you understand the gospel, you understand God brought you here, and you just don't have a choice just to pick up and go and do and be your own. Didn't, didn't uh, Jesus say that to Peter? Peter, Peter, when thou was young, thou girded thyself and went whither thou wouldest go. But when thou art old, another shall gird thee and carry thee, said, stretch forth your hand. Peter, stretch forth your hand. Surrender, that's surrender. When you were young, you went where you would. But when you're old, you stretch forth your hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. So that's the will of God being done in our life. And the will of God carries us where we wouldn't go. The will of God keeps us where we wouldn't stay. Uh, they, they wouldn't stay. Uh, I wouldn't stay probably until the sun came down another day if it were not for the church. The reason I'm here is because of the church. And I'm tied to it. I don't have my free will. I, I don't have my free will. We had a discussion on free will Wednesday night in our Bible study, a discussion. 
I don't have my free will. Uh, my will is His will. Thy will be done. And that's the prayer Jesus said, you pray after this manner. Thy will be done. As it is in heaven, so let it be in earth. Thy will be done. So we don't have our will that we can carry out. We're captives. Uh, uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, said Paul said, I, how does he start that chapter out? Even my uh, Paul beseech you as a prisoner. Isn't that the way he starts that chapter? As a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, I beseech you uh, that you walk worthy of the vocation with your call. Uh, you know, a prisoner doesn't have his will. His will is taken from him. It's not his will. It's the will of those who make him captive. Uh, Brother Bernard testified, and my goodness, so good to have Brother Bernard home and in church with us. Back home with God again. Back where he's safe and he's secure. And he's with the family of God. And uh, God's people cares for him, loves him. We, we, we prove that. We show that. And um, a prisoner doesn't have his will. Uh, but you, you, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. So some, everybody's not a prisoner of the Lord. If they decide to pick up and go somewhere, they go. If they decide to do something, they do it. That's God. I'm free. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody tells me how to do. I'm free. Um, and, and well, I'm not. That's where you and I differ. I'm not. You see, because I must be a prisoner of the Lord, uh, that I may do His will and not my will. Because if I'd done my will, it'd been different than His will. So, as a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of whatever God has called you to do, the vocation, but with your call. And uh, there's there, God, let me get this thought in focus. I want to get down a line where you can follow me. Um, God is eternal. Therefore, God's will is eternal. Uh, now, if you're working on a temporary relationship with God, and I am, I'll say me too, we're out of focus because God's eternal. And uh, if, if, you, if you focus in and you just think, well, I'm going to give God a little bit of me. And you will if you don't, if you don't watch yourself. See, it's the easiest thing in the world to give in to me. To me. It's the easiest thing in the world for you to give in to you. Um, I'll do it in spite of myself. I'll do it. That hurts. All right. Get away from that. that there's pain. I'll stay away from that. Uh, there's some suffering. I, I don't mean that. Uh, you know, uh, there's some discipline there. I don't want that. See, it's the easiest thing in the world for me to take the easiest ride down through life and avoid discipleship, avoid instruction, and avoid, avoid teaching, avoid discipline. Um, and that's, that's where our present uh, young people are. I don't want to say something. The young people are only following the example of the older ones. Don't get too hard on the young people. Where are they getting their pattern from? Where are they getting their example from? Where does that boy get that attitude from? Where does that girl get that attitude from? From us. Because we, we are the pattern for this generation. And if we don't set a pattern of total discipline, and, uh, and, and remember when I'm teaching a lesson, I want everybody, because I teach, sometimes I teach, and I get down in some close quarters. Um, it, how many know the old saying, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it? So, so if, if you're not in this area, you know, any area I talk about, just don't wear it. Just don't wear it, you know. And don't don't get upset. Don't get resentful. Don't don't uh, feel like Brother Marlowe's. He's zeroing on me or zeroing on me. I'm not zeroing on anybody. 
I'm teaching a lesson, and all older ones have not set the wrong example. There are some wonderful fathers, there are some wonderful mothers, there are some wonderful teachers, there are some wonderful examples, but I'm saying collectively, right now, collectively, in this generation, what kind of pattern do our young people have? And I'll leave it at that. We'll get too particular. I'll just leave it at that. What kind of pattern are they looking at? What kind of pattern? Uh, how close do you observe young people? I'm observing a couple right now. Um, and I'm observing a couple right now, because I always observe. And uh, how close do you observe young people? Are they wrong? Well, then, in the right way, instruct them. Take them aside as a father and mother. In the right way, instruct them, teach them. Um, uh, see, uh, how, how, how close do we observe one another? Uh, see, all right, is, is that person, are they in need of some help? Give them the proper help. Don't try to embarrass them or hurt them or, or mm -hmm. wound them or offend them, yeah. but just give them proper help because God is eternal and his work is eternal. Yes. And now, make it on the line of thought where you can hook right into me. Um, so everything that I'm doing in the church must not be on a temporary basis. Um, see, I can't, I can't just be on fire one week, then an iceberg the next week. See, I can't, I can't, I, I can't just make, I am going all the way, bless God, nobody is going to hinder me. And then the least little bump in the road knocks you out of the road. See, because, see, that, that God is eternal. Now, I have to think like God. I can't just be encouraged one week and discouraged the next week. I just can't be lifted up. I'm going to serve him. No matter what, if mama don't go, I'm going. If daddy don't go, I'm going. If, if children don't go, I'm going. Yes. Can't be that. Because you'll be a victim of your emotions. And your emotions will get you in trouble. And you can't be a disciple with your emotions. You have to be uh, to where you're stead... What is that word Paul used? Uh, I'm going I'm to cover a lot of areas here, so stay with me. Uh, say, uh, Paul said, but be ye therefore steadfast. Unmovable. Always, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. First Corinthians 15, closing verses there, the 15th chapter. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, because God is eternal. God is eternal. And everything about God, uh, Sister, can I... Can I share with the church what you spoke to me, Sister Evelyn, you know, about your experience? Can I share that? And Sister Evelyn, while they were praying for the sick, came and said, Brother Marlow, I want you to help me to, because I, I want to know if I'm out of my mind or I'm losing my mind or what's happening to me. She said, I had an experience this morning, and it, it just seemed like I suddenly realized that there's nothing really real in this life. And everything here is just absolutely not real. It's just not reality. It's all passing. It's all temporary. It's not real. Am I telling the essence of it? And uh, she said, am I losing my mind? I said, no, you're just getting your mind. You're becoming the same. When you realize, I said, you're just, you're just getting the right mind. When you realize that everything here is not reality, because it is passive. Everything is passive. It's a passing thing. Then you, well, what does that do for you? You don't fall in love with it then. Because who wants to fall in love with a temporary situation? If you ever fall in love, don't fall in love temporarily. Because it'll be it'll be problems. Because you'll fall out of love. But you see, if, if you 
if you fall in love, let it be forever, eternally. Because uh, Jesus, I said, no, you're not losing your mind. You're just getting your mind. Because the only real thing is heaven. Because heaven is eternal. God is eternal. The word of God is eternal. Everything else is temporary. Uh, God hath appointed man's bounds that he cannot pass. He's numbered his day. Uh, the number of man's years shall be three score and ten at seventy. And if he continue beyond that, it will be labor and sorrow. Well, I've got seven past that, and I can tell you there's been a lot of labor and sorrow <coughs> the last seven years. He was right on the beam. It will be labor and sorrow. See? But so God is eternal, and God's word is eternal, and God is eternal, and his plan is eternal. The plan of God is eternal because God's, uh, God is eternal. In the book of, of Genesis, there's a beautiful picture there of, uh, of showing the, the seasons. God hides things in the Old Testament, and you have to get the mind of God to understand it, otherwise you'll be reading a history book, and history is just history. But if you understand the Old Testament is not a history book. The Old Testament is the apple of gold with pictures of silver in it. Solomon said words fitly spoken is like apples of gold with pictures of silver. And the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So the Old Testament is not history. It's a picture book. And in the 15th chapter of um, Genesis, uh, Abraham had an encounter. I won't read the whole chapter, but he had an encounter. And he was asking God, and you'll find this down to the ninth verse of um, Genesis 15, uh, would he have seen and God promised him, he said, go outside and look at the stars, and your seed will come forth from your own vows, and it will be as the stars in the sky for multitude. And uh, Abraham said, all right, Lord. Then God gave him a particular thing to do. God is very peculiar. If he speaks to you, you may think you're losing your mind for a moment. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. So when God speaks to you, it's not like Sam Smith standing there talking to you. There's no trivialities with God. Everything that God is, is eternal. Everything he instructs you in is eternal. Everything about God is wisdom and no foolishness. Because God is eternal. And so... It takes wisdom to understand. That's why Solomon said, but wisdom is the principal thing. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Then he said, Proverbs 9, but wisdom hath built thy house, hath built her house. So, uh, but here, look what he asked in the ninth verse. Uh, he asked Abraham.